Is Colombia's civil war finally over? An historic peace deal between the Colombian government and FARC rebels is signed after more than half a century of hostilities. But what are the hurdles to a permanent peace? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. In Doha, I'm Adrian Finnegan. We got the best deal possible. Everyone would have liked to get a little more. The words of the Colombian government negotiator as the deal was signed with FARC rebels, ending 52 years of civil war. For the government of President Juan Manuel Santos, the goals were simple, to end the war without giving away too much. A demobilization process is now underway for FARC fighters to hand over their weapons. The armed group is beginning its transformation into a political party. We'll discuss the challenges facing the implementation of that peace deal in just a moment. But first, our report from Alessandro Rampietti in the Colombian capital, Bogota. The leader of the FARC, Timoshenko, made the announcement late on Sunday from Havana, Cuba, ordering its combatants to end all hostilities against the Colombian state starting at midnight on a Sunday. This is another historic step towards a lasting peace in uh, Colombia, and it follows the announcement of the end of the negotiations after four years of talks uh, in Havana, and it also follows the same uh, announcement of a four formal definitive ceasefire on part of the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos. He did that on uh, Saturday. It's just, though, another step, and that's because uh, this is a very long process in uh, bringing forth peace in uh, the country. The next step will be uh, that the FARC leaders will travel back to Colombia to hold their final uh, conference, and that way the FARC guerrillas will also uh, follow, sign uh, this uh, peace agreement. There will be then a formal ceremony in Colombia, and finally on October 2nd, there will be a referendum in which Colombians will have to ratify this deal. So in coming weeks, all the attention will be on this uh, uh, referendum, truly the last obstacle standing between uh, the conflict and uh, peace in Colombia. Well, here's a look at the history of the fight against FARC. The rebel group was formed in the 1960s by small farmers determined to fight against what they saw as oppression and exploitation of the poor by the rich. Their main target has been government security forces. The first peace talks began back in 1998 before stalling many times. They resumed in Cuba four years ago. The FARC has roughly around 12,000 members and earns half its annual income from cocaine trafficking. Colombia was once the kidnapped capital of the world. In 2005, FARC is estimated to have kidnapped 2,500 civilians as well as government workers and soldiers also held for ransom. Well, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. They're all in Bogota. Firstly, uh, Christian Herbelzheimer, who's Director of Transitions to Peace at Conciliation Resources, an international organization working to stop armed conflicts. Annette Idler is Director of Studies at the Changing Character of War program, the University of Oxford. And finally, uh, Bernardo Pedro Salazar, who's uh, a researcher of armed conflict and peace process at the Catholic University of Colombia. Welcome to you all. Christian, we'll start with you. Is this, as the government's chief negotiator, negotiator says, the best deal possible? Definitely. Um, the Colombia has never been so close to peace as today, and the prospects for a successful implementation of a peace agreement are also very good. So definitely, this is a time uh, of, of a watershed in Colombian history, and definitely one of the biggest times in the last, um, most recent decades. Annette, will Colombians accept or reject the deal? It has to be approved in a referendum in October, uh, doesn't it? And, and why on earth w would they reject it? Well, it's not that clear for the casual observer whether there will be um, peace or not. And um, the, um, the country is very divided here. 
But of course there is a lot of enthusiasm and people are looking forward to it. Some people are concerned um, about the ex combatants that they might not be able to reintegrate into civilian life. Um, some others in rural areas, um, where I've done a lot of my field work, um, they are concerned because there are other armed groups as well. So they are not that sure that this peace might actually um, hold throughout the territory um, because of those, um, the presence of those other groups. But overall, we all very much hope um, that there will be a yes vote in October. Bernardo, everyone wants peace. Is this deal the best way to achieve it? What are critics of the deal saying is wrong with it? Well, uh, critics uh, are not happy with the fact that uh, this has been uh, um, the result of a, a political negotiation. Uh, critics would like to have had uh, the end of the war uh, as a military um, outcome, and so they, they would have uh, liked for there to be a capitulation instead of a, a political negotiation. So that means that um, the sh uh, the, um, most of the responsibility for all the atrocities will not be only um, on the side of the guerrilla. It will have to be shared by um, the rest of society, by the army, uh, as well as by businessmen who have been involved in, in, in one way or another, supporting one or the other side. So, so that means that um, the, 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 the peace process will bring costs to all sides, and, and that's why the critics um, are reluctant to this particular peace process. All right, we'll explore some of those uh, costs, as, uh, as you put it, uh, throughout the program. Christian, it, it's taken four years of hard negotiations to reach this deal. How much longer, though, will it take to bring about real peace? Well, um, I think uh, one of the big innovations in this peace process, learning from the lessons from past, is the government and FARC were very clear that in Havana, where they were having the negotiations over these past years, they were not building peace. What they were doing is setting the conditions for building peace. That is a challenge and a responsibility for society at large. So what they have achieved now is essentially to stop the war which was the main precondition for building peace. Now, the country needs a number of structural transformations in order to secure a just and lasting peace, but also um, equitable, equitable development um, for everybody in this country. And that will take, some issues can be achieved in the short term, others will take a little bit longer. And some, like I would say reconciliation, um, can take a generation. And it are all of the, the FARC's fighters in favor of this deal, or, or do you think that some will, will, will split away and continue their, their struggle with other armed groups that are operating in Colombia? Well, so the FARC, they are a very hierarchical um, organization, and Timoshenko, the leader, has given the order um, for the definite ceasefire. Um, so we hope that most of them will comply. But there is one front, um, the front one, that has already declared that they may not join the demobilization process. So they might um, basically join or create their own group. There's also a risk that some of um, the ex-combatants might simply join criminal groups. Um, Colombia um, is also um, suffering a lot of the transnational organized crime, so the drug trade, um, other forms of trafficking, human trafficking, arms trafficking, and there are of course opportunities for them in these illegal businesses. Now these will only be um, some of them. Um, there's still a good chance that um, the majority of ex-combatants will actually go to what's now called the normalization zones, the areas where they will demobilize, where they will lay down their weapon, and where they will also prepare um, to reintegrate into civilian life. So it is a mixed um, panorama, and there are risks, especially in the marginalized border areas that are particularly prone to um, transnational organized crime. Um, but overall, um, there is still a good chance that um, many of them will be able to integrate into civilian life. Bernardo, has the, has the government conceded too much to the rebels? Well, um, I think that um, the deal that has been uh, agreed is, is well balanced because, um, of course, uh, the government um, would have um, preferred uh, an outcome where they didn't have to come to negotiations with FARC. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think that um, it would have been much more costly 
for for um, the population, especially the population which is out in rural areas, and who's been bearing most of the cost of the of the armed conflict, and it would have taken maybe another 20 years to to do away with um, um, a, a, a military force which is well trained, which has been weakened, of course, uh, by by the Colombian army, but that um, could still have a lot of um, activity and, and had the capacity to do a lot of harm against infrastructure and, and against uh, the most vulnerable population. So, so I think that uh, for the government and um, for the country, it, it is important to uh, end uh, uh, this ceaseless violence uh, that has been going on for so long, which didn't have much of a point. And I think that FARC recognized that they they, they were sincere enough to come to terms with the fact that they would never be able to take power by arms. Uh, so I think that uh, FARC also feels that they, they're getting a, a good deal. I think both parties uh, feel that they're getting a good deal. And, and, I, and one of the most interesting things about this uh, negotiation process is that uh, both have learned to co collaborate over the past four years, uh, which is something uh, which um, speaks positively about the process. But, but Christian, uh, coming back to the, that point about whether the government has, has conceded too much to the rebels, that, that some people in Colombia have expressed a sense that, that some FARC rebels who, who may have committed atrocities are going to get away with their crimes. If they confess, they'll be given, what, community service uh, programs to, to, to serve. Um, does the deal offer an amnesty for human rights abusers? No, I think actually one of the innovations in this um, peace agreement is that more than ever before in any other peace negotiations, the rights of victims to truth, justice, reparations, and the guarantees of non-repetition have been um, informing um, the whole negotiations. It has been, it is still the most contentious issue in Colombia. Um, but um, from a global perspective, um, never before has a rebel organization um, and state forces who have actually also been responsible of grave human rights violations agreed to a mechanism that will bring up all the truth and there will be investigation, uh, there will be probation, there will be sentencing. So um, I think both sides have been very careful to try the best to avoid impunity, which was the main concern of the country. Now, what has the, the, this discussion led to in Colombia? Well, uh, a better and a deeper understanding of what are the expectations when we talk about justice. And in a very simple way, justice is often perceived as just putting perpetrators behind bars and letting them rot in jail. Well, this is a punitive justice, and um, this peace agreement is moving away from that for a more restorative justice, looking at what are the expectations of the victims themselves, and then trying to adjust in as much as possible to meet um, those expectations of the victims. So we're moving much more to a restorative justice framework. It's important to remember, nowhere in the world has a rebel or a state signed agreement um, and then in order to have their main leaders go straight to jail. That has never happened before. So um, what they have achieved in Colombia is actually a, a big step forward compared to other prog progresses, processes in the world where indeed amnesty has been the rule. Annette, so we have a deal here between the FARC and Colombia's government, there are, though, many other interested parties in the country. Who has most to gain or lose from this peace deal? Well, so the main other group um, that is relevant here is the second largest rebel group, which is the ELN. Um, and they have presence also throughout the country. They are not as large as the FARC. And they have also already announced that they would start um, peace, um, peace negotiations. So that was back in, in March this year. 
Since then, however, there were issues um, surrounding kidnapping. They have not agreed to stop um, kidnapping and to release the hostages, and this is why they haven't really um, officially started um, peace negotiations. Now, the risk now is that um, they might attract ex-combatants, FARC ex-combatants. They might use this as an opportunity to strengthen themselves. They have presence in, um, in marginalized areas, for example, in Arauca, which is in the, south, in the east, southern east of um, Colombia at the border with um, Venezuela. And what they do there is they not only fight, they actually control, they govern the territory. So um, they provide services, um, health, um, education, infrastructure. They're involved in, in normal um, daily life, and they might now benefit from, from that situation. Now, this is not the only group. There is another fraction, a rebel fraction, EPL. Um, there are many right-wing groups, criminal groups, um, those involved in the drug trade, and those that emerged after the demobilization of the, of the parliamentaries here. So there is a panorama of many, many different groups, and what is crucial now is that the government um, is able to um, fill those power voids um, that will um, emerge once the FARC um, leaves, that they fill, that they occupy those spaces to make sure that those other groups can't recruit them, that those other groups can't get the support of the local population, and that the state basically shows that the state is the one um, that is perceived to be legitimate, by also bringing civilian institutions in those areas. So that includes, um, as I said, infrastructure, education, health. And this is a window of opportunity. This is an opportunity to show those people um, that they are acknowledged by the state um, and that they will be taken care of rather than by those other violent groups. But Ada, how, how much is this peace deal going to cost Colombia? Can the country afford it? Is the government going to be able to make good on its, on its promises of investment in various social projects in, in rural areas? Well, um, there have been different calculations about the cost, uh, but uh, generally it, it would cost about, uh, the, 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 most of the estimates come to uh, an amount which is equal to what um, the country's uh, annual, the public budget, the public annual budget amounts to uh, in, in one year. So. Um, of course, uh, that's a lot of money. Um, it won't be uh, invested uh, over the next year, of course. It will be invested over uh, the course of 10 or 20 years. Um, we, we're not in the best the financial situation, the fiscal situation. Oil prices have plummeted, so that was one of the big earners for the Colombian government. So this is not the best moment. But, um, but I think that um, one of uh, the advantages of, of being in a tight budget situation is that corruption will have to necessarily be controlled. And right now, after years of, of, uh, of, of booming oil prices, corruption is rampant all over the country. And that's one of the main reasons why people mistrust the government. Um, so one of the challenges that the government and FARC will have before them is how to ensure that the money, if it's uh, 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 not a lot of money, but whatever money is uh, assigned to uh, building peace, uh, it will be well used and it will not be lost uh, through corruption. So that's, co I, I think uh, that's one of uh, the main challenges we have right now before us. All right, so Christian, on, on that issue of trust, how does the Colombian government go about reassuring people that voting for, for peace is going to produce positive change? Um, well, the main challenge probably in a context where there is limited trust um, in government um, is that the campaign for the yes and the plebiscite is not perceived as an endorsement of this president or this um, government's policy but something that goes beyond party politics is in the interest of the society at large. So it is important that um, the main number of political parties join this process, but also a number of other significant stakeholders. I'm talking here about the religious organizations and institutions, um, academic institutions, civil society organizations, very importantly, the business sector, and then, of course, um, mayors, governors, um, the Senate, the Congress, everybody stands behind this yes vote and makes um, people understand why this is the best opportunity ever 
for change. And of course, without promising that everything will be better the day after, because that's not true and that's not going to happen. One of the main challenges in a peace process is to manage expectations and avoid frustration. But definitely, Colombia has never been so close to stopping the war with the main armed group in Colombia. And of course, there will be a number of challenges thereafter in the implementation of the agreement with FARC and also with other sources okay. of violence. But it will be much easier to deal with those right. after the agreement. It's got to manage expectations. It also has to manage risks, doesn't it, uh, Annette? How will the government and, and the UN mission in Colombia go about managing risks to civilians in that transitional uh, period? Well, so there are lots of risk, obviously, um, and the whole process is very complex. They will move um, the ex-combatants to those normalization zones that are spread across the country. Um, and those zones, they are secured by what they call three safety rings. So there will be international observers. The UN mission is there um, to verify the process, to monitor the process as well. There is a second um, safety ring secured by the police. And then there's an outer ring that is um, secured by the armed forces. Now here the double challenge really is that on the one hand, their job is really to protect, in a way, the ex-combatants. And Hename here, the, the head of the army, has prepared um, his soldiers very well for that. But they also have to continue um, their fight, well, the counterinsurgency basically, against the ELN and other groups. So what that means for civilians then is that they might be stigmatized as um, collaborators, as far collaborators. They might receive threats from those other groups if they are not um, behaving the way they're expected to behave. But I do think that um, the way it has been planned, and there are very complex and long protocols that have been negotiated in Havana as well, that they will help to make right. sure um, okay. that civilians are protected. All right, this, this makes it's also important to know that those zones are in rural areas. Yeah. I, I just want to, sorry, sorry, areas, sorry to in interrupt to you. We're, we're, we're rapidly civilians. running out of time, Annette. I just want to know what happens when those normalization zones cease, cease to exist and, and, and the UN leaves. Well, this is what is still the gray zone. So they will last for 180 days. And the plan is that by then uh, they are prepared to reintegrate into civilian life. Um, but what needs to be done now is have a clear plan, a, a clear strategy on what happens afterwards. Um, and what happens also to the civilian population there. Okay. Uh, Bernardo, uh, how difficult is it going to be to integrate former fighters into civil life in Colombia? Well, we've had uh, several experiences uh, in the past, uh, the most recent with the paramilitaries in this sense. And um, in general, it, they have been positive. But the difference this time is that most likely um, most of the, the reintegration into civil life will not be in urban areas as was in the past. But this time it will probably be in the, the same rural areas where most of the ex-combatants come from. And they'll be probably organized in cooperatives uh, and they'll probably have productive projects. Um, so I think that the process will be um, uh, more controlled, and uh, to say, to, to use a, a term, uh, it's probably you'll have uh, um, people who will uh, go into criminal activity, but uh, I think most of that will be controlled uh, by the, the scheme that uh, FARC are, are thinking of. Uh, putting into place once they become a political movement and they also want to have an economic base for their mm -hmm. for their ex -competence. so so that looks pretty good okay. um, as Annette mentioned the, the main risk for the uh, local population will be the presence of other criminal groups and, and the uh, and if the ELN doesn't uh, come to terms to a negotiation it will probably um, deteriorate into a criminal group okay. uh, and the government will have a, a hard time trying to control them. But, uh, but I know, they... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We, we are, we're out of time. Many thanks indeed, uh, though, for that. To all of you, uh, thanks for taking part in the program. Christian Herbelzheimer, Annette Idler, and Bernardo Perez Salazar, all in Bogota. As always, thanks to you for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time by going to our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, please go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. See you again. Bye for now.